the longer spells of rain move through the Northern Isles and disappear. Showers continue for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but they'll be more scattered one or two further south as well, but actually plenty of clear spells by the start of Sunday. Temperatures will be similar on Sunday morning to Saturday morning, so double figures for many, but perhaps single figures in the far south. A bright start, sunny spells for much of England and Wales, one or two showers still across northern England, but the lion's share of showers will be for Northern Ireland as well as Scotland, along with that blustery wind. It just won't be quite as windy as Saturday. Monday looks fine for many, some wet weather in the north on Tuesday. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilized conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. On Mark Dolan tonight, my Mark Meets guest is cancelled comedy legend Duncan Norvell. A man famous for the chase me catchphrase. Find out why he was cancelled at 10. It's an absolute disgrace. In the big question, if Boris goes, is it game over for Brexit? Also in the news agenda with my amazing panel, is the internet left wing? Is Keir Starmer too boring to be prime minister? And can you be friends with your neighbours? Plus. Why are women now under pressure to remove all of their body hair? Just what's going on? And in my big opinion, it's not the job of food giants like Ben & Jerry's to decide the country's border policy. That is my take at 10. But next up, who is running Britain? Find out after the headlines with Ray Addison. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB newsroom. The Prime Minister has welcomed a High Court decision refusing an injunction to halt a deportation flight to Rwanda next week. Almost 100 legal challenges had been made against the government's policy, with lawyers arguing that the country is not safe. That's a statement that Home Secretary Priti Patel has denied. Around 31 migrants are now due on the first flight next Tuesday. However, the judge has granted permission to appeal. That could be heard as early as Monday. Sir Keir Starmer says his party will vote against the government's plan to override elements of the Northern Ireland Protocol when it's brought to the Commons on Monday. After meeting with political leaders in Northern Ireland, the Labour leader said he believes the deadlock over power sharing could be resolved through negotiation. The DUP is refusing to form an executive in protest against the protocol. Ukraine's foreign minister says they will work with Britain to ensure the release of two men sentenced to death in the separatist region of Donetsk. 
Aidan Aslin and Sean Pinner, both British citizens, were found guilty of mercenary activities by a court there. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss described the verdict as a sham. Boris Johnson has ordered ministers to do everything in their power to bring them home. Deputy Director for Research at Amnesty International, Denis Krivoshev, says Russia must respect the men's rights. This is not a trial. There should be no decision which is called death penalty, which it isn't, even isn't. And they should be treated as any prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions. None of that is happening. That's what must happen. So cancel that decision. Don't pretend it's a trial and provide them with their rights, which they have as prisoners of war. A teenage boy has been killed at his home in Manchester in what police have called a ferocious stabbing. The 15-year-old's mother was also injured in the attack in Miles Platting last night. She's now in a stable condition in hospital. Greater Manchester police are warning the public not to approach the suspect, who's described as an Asian man in his 40s. He's believed to have been known to the victims. A recording of an ex-soldier telling a 999 operator that he'd killed his neighbours has been released. Neighbours been stabbed by who? By me. By you? Yes. Jurors at Bristol Crown Court heard the clip where Colin Reeves admitted stabbing Jennifer and Stephen Chappell to death in November last year. Other footage appears to show the neighbours clashing over a parking space taken ten days before the ex-commando killed the couple at their home in Somerset. Reeves has denied murder but admitted manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. We're on TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Now back to Mark Dolan tonight. Welcome to a very busy Mark Dolan tonight in The Big Question. If Boris goes, is it game over for Brexit? We'll hear from all sides on that one. In the news agenda with my brilliant panel, is the internet left wing? Is Keir Starmer simply too boring to be prime minister? Can you be friends with your neighbours? And why are women now under pressure to remove all of their body hair? Reacting to those stories and many more are my fantastic panel of legendary radio and TV broadcaster Neil Dr. Fox, TV personality and impressionist Francine Lewis, and writer and broadcaster Charlie Peters. My Mark Meets guest is comedy legend Duncan Norvell, famous for the chase me, chase me catchphrase. We'll talk about his amazing career and why he was cancelled. Find out why just after 10. I want to hear from you throughout the show. You know the best part of my programme is when you get in touch. Mark at GBnews.uk. And this show has a golden rule. What is that rule? We don't do boring. Not on my watch. I just won't have it. So for the next two hours, big debates, big guests, big opinions and some fun along the way. Let's get cracking. Mark my words, Britain faces a crisis of confidence in its public sector. Rail unions, medical unions and God knows how many other public sector industries are holding the country to ransom, threatening strikes over pay rises that our wrecked economy cannot afford. And it was, of course, so many in the public sector who wanted lockdowns and other Covid measures which have led us to where we are today. The cost of living it's the cost of lockdown, the biggest I told you so in history. And don't forget, teaching unions were behind the push to close schools during the pandemic, something now widely accepted as a colossal mistake, producing a generation of damaged kids. And many other unions pushed for workplace closures and ridiculous COVID protocols. Jobsworth bonkers safetyism was rife. Not satisfied with guiding the COVID strategy, the trade unions now look to be in the driving seat when it comes to our pay strategy. Now, I'm a great believer in trade unions, without whom we would be living in Dickensian Britain. Everyone deserves a great wage for a great day's work. The millions of hardworking people we have in this country are the real aristocracy of Britain. 
And the unions are doing their job standing up for their workers, many of whom are going through a very tough time. But read the room, folks. The country's skint, and pay rises from printed money will stoke inflation, which is already nuking the economy. More spending will simply pour petrol on the flames. And more borrowing, or even more tax rises, just aren't an option. Our economy would go from sinking to sunk. At this time of economic pain, Margaret Thatcher would have faced the unions down, as she did in the early 80s, following the winter of discontent, when everyone and their mum was on strike. Don't forget, they weren't even burying the bodies of the dead. But beleaguered, partied-out Prime Minister Boris Johnson may not have the stomach for the battle. Don't forget, he failed to face down those prophets of doom, witty and valance and sage, over lockdowns. So I won't hold my breath. Meanwhile, the civil service union are also threatening to go on strike over planned cuts. I'm not sure we'll notice much of a difference after so many have been, in inverted commas, working from home feeding their addiction to daytime TV, baking banana bread, and cracking open the first bottle of San Miguel at 5 p.m. as they peruse their last emails of the day. Nice work, if you can get it. And how about the NHS, who you would think are concerned about a potential waiting list of 12 million people, but are too busy rewriting the biology textbooks, making a web page on ovarian cancer, wait for it, gender-free. That's right, they've made a web page about ovarian cancer, gender-free, with no mention of the word women. Instead, they state, anyone with ovaries can get ovarian cancer. Anyone with ovaries can get ovarian cancer. Yes, and anyone with money can go private. This madness is on top of health bosses calling women birthing people and replacing the term breastfeeding with chest feeding. What a bunch of tits. What sticks in the craw with the NHS and this highly politicised, divisive nonsense which cancels women is that you and I are paying for it. We're bankrolling this rubbish. God help you if you're treated by an NHS doctor that doesn't know the difference between a man and a woman. Good luck when he or she takes out your kidney. I say he or she, it's probably they, them. Which brings me to the Rwanda issue. Now, the policy of processing the applications of illegal migrants crossing the channel in Rwanda may not be everyone's cup of tea. I haven't a clue if it will work. I'm not sure the government do either. But ultimately, something has to be done. The law is being broken. People forget that. The crossings are illegal. And this is a humanitarian crisis, with thousands of people risking their lives as they make this perilous crossing from France. By doing nothing, we are effectively supporting an evil business model in which people traffickers, effectively modern-day slavers, take thousands of pounds from desperate people on the promise of a new life in Britain. Many of these people may be in a terrible situation, and it is devastating. But they're in France, which is a safe country, though anyone seeking to flee France does have my sympathies. So whilst the unions are dictating to the government overpay, Gender ideologues are running the NHS. Woke campaigners now appear to be running the Home Office. The Mail newspaper report that Home Office civil servants opposing migrant deportations to Rwanda have put up posters comparing Paddington Bear to an illegal immigrant as they refuse, that's right, refuse to work on policy. They've also posted refugees welcome stickers around offices. Meanwhile, an anonymous Our Home Office account on Twitter launched its campaign last month with a note said to have been posted on an official notice board which reads as follows. We have the spine to say no minister. The account, which uses an orange heart for its profile picture, comes amid claims that some staff are threatening a mutiny over the Rwanda policy despite political impartiality being a legal requirement for civil servants. Two questions I would put to them. What other ideas do you have to smash this criminal and devastating business model? And two, why do you have an opinion? You are a civil servant, a paid employee of the state, whose job it is to execute the policy 
of the democratically elected government. Now, if Jeremy Corbyn wanted to come in and nationalise everything, if he's won an election, good luck to him. If a Tory gets in and wants to privatise everything, ditto. That's how democracy works. And for these paid government employees, often with jobs for life and gold-plated pensions, and many of whom can't be bothered to go back into the office, surely this is against the terms of their employment contract. These public servants have gone AWOL. Who voted for the NHS to erase female biology and spend millions on diversity officers for an organisation that is possibly the most diverse on earth, the NHS? Who voted for civil servants to thwart the government's border policy? Policing our borders properly was in the Tory manifesto, which produced the biggest conservative landslide victory since the 80s. If civil servants want to be political, no problem, go into politics. But until then, your job is to execute government policy. If it's government policy to wear yellow underpants on a Tuesday, crack on and make it happen. I like yellow underpants, very slimming. Our public sector is no longer in public hands. Large numbers of state employees are an ideological cabal of political campaigners who are seeking to change society from within. The problem is that no election can get rid of them in the way that we can get rid of MPs and governments. If people in the public sector want to be political, then go for it. As I've said, enter politics. But don't take the state dollar if you can't play by the rules. The political opinions of a civil servant should be as ambiguous as those of Mickey Mouse, Tom and Jerry or Scooby-Doo. But when I look at what's happening to our public institutions, I think, yikes, let's get out of here, Scoobs. These people are scarier than the school caretaker. So who runs Britain? At the moment, it's the unions, the public sector and woke, unaccountable corporations. It's clear to me that the only people who should be governing the country are the government. The clue's in the name. Reacting to the big stories of the day tonight are my all-star panel, legendary TV and radio presenter Neil Dr. Fox, TV personality and impressionist Francine Lewis, and journalist, writer and broadcaster Charlie Peters. Charlie, if I could start with you, who runs Britain? The Blob. Simple as that, as you put it. I mean, all these public sector workers who get away, frankly, with political murder in their jobs, they can do so because there is a huge undertrapping in the state of legalistic structures and organisations that support leftist policies, regardless of who's actually in power. We have uh, a vote every five years to decide if we're going to have essentially uh, Tories uh, or members of the Labour Party in charge. But really, the people who actually run the country receive public funding and enjoy loyally support to ensure that their progressive ideas are secured regardless. And unfortunately, the Tories, despite being in charge for over a decade now, have done nothing to remove any of these structures. Uh, the issue we've got, Francine, is none of us voted for our institutions to be changed like this from within. Yeah, honestly, it's, it's a major problem. But you know what? I don't know who should run Britain. All I know is, you know what, Mrs. It should be me, Mrs. Owen Ozzy, and I'm so happy Neil Fox <laughs> is right next to me again because he's fabulous, darlings. <laughs> Well, maybe Sharon Osborne should be running the country because she would be doing perhaps a better job than our current civil service. Um, I'm just very concerned about the idea, Neil, of civil servants refusing to carry out policy. That's their job. Yeah, I mean, that is worrying, isn't it? Um, I, may I just be slightly controversial here and not knock all civil servants, though, because I think we have to remember that an awful lot of them do do 
good work. Look at last week in the UK with the carnage and the mess and the car crash happening in the political spectrum, whether it was the Conservatives or Labour. It was a mess in the House of Parliament. Actually, what happened with the Jubilee was organised by a, a, a back room of people who did an amazing job. So there are people who do, in a way, keep things going. Uh, obviously, we hear about the ones that are causing some problems at the moment. And, uh, I mean, part of the problem, I, I think, really here is the uh, two things. One, we don't really have a government that really quite knows what it's doing. We don't have an opposition that's really an effective opposition. So within that area, it's not very good. And then we have the rise of social media. It's become so strong now that everywhere around the country, everyone has an opinion. And that opinion can get from people maybe towards the edges or who don't have the normal viewpoints, can get very loud and shouty. They know how to shout very well. And so it becomes this big noisy mess. And we don't really have anyone quite running things. I, I noticed a tweet today from Alistair Campbell, and I can't believe that Alistair Campbell wrote this, but he said, can you imagine what Mrs Thatcher, he said, not that he was a big fan of hers, but would have made of what's going on at the moment. She knew how to be in control, had a cabinet that was in control. Uh, my God, they would have looked at the shambles going on now and have been embarrassed about the whole thing and would have sorted it out. Or at I least mean, have the balls to take it on. For, for sure. I, I take your point as well about, about uh, there, there are great civil servants in this country and yeah. great aspects uh, of our public sector. I think it's just a minority rump of ideologues or ideologues mm. or of campaigners who are abusing their position to actually influence and change the shape of our society. I mean, Neil, for example, we all pay for the NHS. Yep. And yet, if the NHS is going to erase women by removing references to females in relation to ovarian cancer, surely we have a say in that. Yeah, I mean, this is simply insane. When you hear about things like that, I mean, I'm surprised that, and I hope that women are up in arms about this, as men should be. It's just not common sense. It's just mm. not logical. It's woke gone to some nth degree. And it's, I don't know how much money it costs to do this. It's a vast fortune. But it also just makes absolutely no sense at all. I don't know what sort of message it's sending down as well to kids and young girls and young males as well in society growing up so confused. It must be so odd hearing all this, thinking, what? I mean, literally, the, us adults are going, I'm sorry, imagine if you're like 15 or 16, just sort of those changes in life. You're a young girl. You must be so confused. It's ridiculous. Yeah, Francine, apologies in advance. I, I didn't get a chance to examine you before the programme. By which gender do you identify? <laughs> Well, uh, totally female. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I think it's so confusing for, for the young generation. It really is. And uh, as Neil said, I'm confused myself, let alone, yeah, the younger generation. It, it's all bizarre. It really is. And, and what, you know, what is, you know, as, as a woman, what is, you know, your, what are your emotions when, when you read that the NHS doesn't refer to women? in relation to ovarian cancer? I just think this has gone way too far. Mm. I mean, it's, you know, I just think, like, in 10 years' time, what is this, you know, world going to be like? Um, you know, as, we, as you said, you know, women have ovaries. Men don't. Simple as that. <laughs> and uh, it, it's just gone too far. And I think, you know, how much further are they going to take this? And um, it's just ridiculous and confusing. Well, yeah, you, you say men don't have ovaries. I mean, I've never had plastic surgery, but never say never, Francine, <laughs> each to their own. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's the thing, Charlie, it is about who runs the country, isn't it? I mean, let's talk about the unions. Clearly, <laughs> lots of people, millions of people, are going through financial hell at the moment. But we're just not in a position, are we, to give people a pay rise, to print money we haven't got, mm -hmm. to stoke the fires of inflation and to further bankrupt our economy? Absolutely. We talk a lot at the moment about backlogged Britain, don't we, about the number of public bodies that are struggling to perform their duties. And I think while the public sector is so bloated and struggling, to uh, talk about pay rises, I think, is um, unacceptable, quite frankly. Uh, on top of that, when I mean, you consider that real wages are going to be the same 
in 2026 as they were in 2008. It's almost two decades without any improvement in your income. Um, I think it's outlandish to suggest that we should be chucking more money towards the public sector at this time. And just briefly, I want to go back onto the NHS diversity point, because I think mm. we complain about these diversity managers and these rules all the time, but it's very rare that we hear people actually talking about why these places are required, why these rules are required, and why these people are hired. We have structures in place in the law, such as the Equality Act and the Public Sector Equality Duty, that mandate these things. These are laws brought in by Labour governments that Tories have presided over and done nothing to remove, and they will complain that it's woke gone mad, but it's the law. These things are guaranteed to happen mm. if we don't remove the legalistic and political structures that allow woke to flourish in our public sector. And we know briefly, Charlie, that nature abhors a vacuum. Is the government slightly accountable for for the AWOL civil servants. You Absolutely. Know, are the government asleep at the wheel letting this happen? Yeah, well, there's only one man I, I can see in the government trying to fight against the civil service at the moment, and it's, uh, it's that extraordinary bloke, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Um, maybe not the best person to be running a, a public campaign against an organisation, but he's doing a very good job, I think, of reminding us that these people are taking, as you say, gold-plated pensions, brilliant pay rises, while they are stuck at home not going to work. He's fighting a great campaign to actually get the civil service to work for the people, not from home. Should the government do more to crack down on woke civil servants? Let me know your thoughts. Mark at gbnews.uk. A very busy show tonight. At 10, my Mark meets guest is the comedy legend, the cancelled comedy legend, Duncan Norvell. Also at 10, we'll have another mini monologue. My take at 10, my first public comments about these jokers, Ben and Jerry's, with a strong view on Britain's border policy. Here are what I've got to say about that at 10 o'clock. Also in the news agenda later with my brilliant panel, is the internet systemically left-wing? Is Keir Starmer too boring to actually be prime minister? Can you be friends with your neighbours? And why are modern women under pressure to remove all of their body hair? We'll discuss that, plus much more. But next up in the big question, is Brexit dead if Boris goes? We'll discuss that from all sides. See you in two. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. A big reaction to my big opinion monologue. Let's see what you've got to say. Graham, dear Mark, the truth is the country is being held to ransom by a bunch of bitter Remainers who will never accept the decision of a democratic vote and will do anything to topple Boris and the government. Starmer, the arch Remainer, is already making noises 
about renegotiation with the EU. If Ramonas are allowed to win, democracy will be dead, not just Brexit. Well, we'll discuss Brexit in just a moment. Um, how about this from Marion in regards to who runs Britain? That's the theme of my big opinion monologue. Well, Marion says these are the people destroying the UK. Unions, civil servants, but most of all, the lefty woke Labour Party. Thank you for your excellent monologue. I agree with everything you've said. I feel since the pandemic, whilst we go out to work, these lazy civil servants sit at home in their gardens, not answering phones. If we lose Boris, it will be back into Europe for the UK. Um, look, we'll get to, straight to that now in our big opinion, because that is tonight's topic of the big question. Yes, indeed, it's time for the big question in which we tackle a major news story of the day. Tonight, the Prime Minister survived uh, a vote of confidence this week, but faced rejection from 40% of Tory MPs who would like to see him replaced. So he's dodged a bullet, having survived this mutiny, but still on life support. It begs the question, what are the implications for Brexit in the possible absence of Boris Johnson? If Boris Johnson goes, is it game over for Brexit? To debate this, I'm delighted to welcome the CEO of First Property Group and former Brexit Party MEP, Ben Habib. Also, we've hit the bullseye with our next guest, TV presenter and arguably the biggest personality in professional darts, remains supporting sports legend Bobby George. And last but not least, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at King's College London, Jonathan Portes. Jonathan, great to have you on the show. Long time no speak. If Boris Johnson goes, Jonathan, is it game over for Brexit? Uh, no, um, I don't think that there's any realistic prospect of the UK um, rejoining or being in a position to rejoin the EU in the near future. That's not what's on the agenda. It would be an opportunity to reset relations with the EU. The EU have decided, as indeed has, of course, the vast majority of the British population, um, that, Bo that a Boris Johnson promise isn't worth anything, that he's prepared to sign a deal and claim it's a great deal and then walk away from it. Um, so uh, anyone from the EU's point of view will be, regardless of their previous political views or their views on Brexit, whether they're they've been a, re a remainder or a lever, will be at least someone they can do business with. So it would be a chance to put the relationship on a more constructive footing, but that doesn't mean Brexit's going to be reversed. That is a pipe dream of a few, um, uh, uh, um, at the moment, remainers who are you know, a long way from power and a long way from doing anything with it, and with some Brexiteers who want to manufacture spectres that simply don't exist. But for the vast majority of the British population, Brexit for the moment is settled. Uh, Jonathan Portes, in the absence of Boris Johnson, might a future prime minister listen to the siren voices calling for a partial re-entry? For example, a rejoining of the single market as proposed by backbench Tory MP Tobias Elwood? Um, I think that's possible, but not in the immediate future. But I think talking about partial rejoining is, is let's be clear, this is not... A meaningful term, right? I mean, you're a member of the EU or you're not. You're, you sign up to the treaties of the EU or you don't. Countries which are in the single market, like Norway um, and to some extent Switzerland, are not members of the EU. This is simply a fact. So people who talk about being in the single market as, oh, it's just like being in the EU. It has pros and cons. Um, uh, and there are, lot, there are good arguments for and against being a member of the single market or being outside of the EU. But let's not call it something it's not. That's just, you know, that, 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 that's silly. It's a different status. It's status like Norway, like Switzerland. It has its advantages and disadvantages. It's not being a member. For sure, Jonathan, but membership of the customs union or a customs union or membership of the single market certainly isn't Brexit, is it? Um, well, it is Brexit in the dictionary sense. Um, you remember that before before the referendum, lots of people from Nigel Farage to Daniel Hannan to once or you know to, to various other uh, uh, prominent voices on the Leave side said that we could leave the EU and stay in the single market, and that would be quite a good outcome. Daniel Hannan, a leading Brexiteer, wrote a long article in the Telegraph this weekend saying that. 
um, we should have stayed in the single market even after Brexit. Um, so I'm not saying that it's a, the right course for Britain. Um, that's not my job. Um, but it certainly would still be Brexit in the legal and political sense, yes. Bring the remains supporting sports legend Bobby George into this. Bobby, great to have you back on the show. Um, and I want to uh, ask Bobby because uh, Bobby voted Remain. Of course, Remain did not win that uh, referendum, but Remainers still are in strong voice, particularly online. Um, Bobby, in the absence of Boris Johnson, is Brexit at risk? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, what is, they've done the deal. I mean, all right, I, I said I'll remain. Um, it didn't work out. Um, the deal's done. You know, you've got to go by the majority of the people who vote for one side or the other, and they voted to, to leave it. But I think, I've got, I must say this, Mark, why are most people wanted to leave the UE because they was fed up with all the people coming into the country, um, putting their hand in the UK um, uh, purse, taking money out of our system, using our national wealth, our housing, um, one thing or another, and they're on the, I'll call it on the drip, that means like on the handouts. There are too many of them, and they wanted to stop that because Boris Johnson said, we will not have uh, freedom of travel so much. Uh, they get, he's going to knock this, he didn't do nothing. So, in fact, we've got more people now um, coming up from abroad, living in our country. If we have any more, it, 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 it probably sink a couple of feet, England will, or the British Isles. So, <laughs> I don't think it make any difference if Boris is there or not. It's done and it's dusted and it didn't come across what they said they was going to come across for the people that vote to leave. Mm. Well, yes, I mean, Bobby, uh, you know, I don't know how keen you are on Boris Johnson as a prime minister, but isn't one argument for keeping Boris that with Boris in number 10, there is no debate about Brexit. It's going to be, you know, the full fat Brexit. Uh, rather than Brexit light. Uh, if we lost Boris Johnson, if somebody else, a Remainer Prime Minister, came into number 10, we'd have all of those debates again, and surely that wouldn't be great for the country. Well, we don't want to keep on and on. Once something's done, it's done. I mean, you get a bit sick when you think, oh, well, you know, we're going to leave the UE. But that's the, if they have a vote, they have a vote. But... What they do, these politicians, I'm not a politician, I don't talk like a politician, I, I, they tell lies. All of them are lies. All of them. You ask them a question, they never say yes or no. They go around a corner. If you go to court, you say, did you do that, yes or no? They go around corners, so they never done it, or they never said it, but they did. Boris said he's going to do this, do that, and he didn't do it. So... If he leaves, I don't think they could go back to the UE. I, don't, I think we've left it and that's it. We've, once you've uh, made your bed, you've got a lie in it, I suppose. But um, that is what I think majority of people, if you ask them, if they, if they didn't um, tell lies as such, because when you ask people on their own, they say, oh, yeah, I think you're right there, Bobby. But when you've got a crowd, they all keep quiet. They don't like overseas people coming in our country all the time and they're using all the resources up and the people that work put money in the pot well if you put money in the pot you should be able to take it out of the pot but these overseas people come here in, in our system and take money out of the pot and don't put nothing in and if the they people who here, come from overseas they... put in more than the people who live here as it happens and take out less on average I mean, you know, I'm an economist, this is what I do. Uh, people from overseas, um, especially people from Europe, are more likely to have a job than people uh, born here. Um, and they're more likely to pay in more in tax and take out less of the benefit system um, than people born here. So frankly, um, it's, uh, 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 they're doing us a favor by coming here, by working in the NHS, by working in, uh, um, on the, you know, as they have done for the last 50 years, um, on the buses, in restaurants, on farms, in banks, and all the rest of it. Um, and to suggest that actually we lose out because migrants come here, get jobs, pay taxes, help finance our pensions, help finance our health service, help work in our work in our health service um, is frank. And you know, is first of all, it's not true. And second of all, the claim that most British people actually feel like you do and don't like foreigners. 
That also is false. Actually, the vast majority of British people think that migrants are immigration is good for okay. the country. Okay, uh, Bobby? Bobby? People come to the country and take an advantage of our system. I didn't say I didn't like them. You put that. I didn't say that. And I don't believe if you do that for a living, I think you got your sums wrong. Because not only people from abroad, I'm talking about people who live in this country as well, who people who are on the on the dole and don't go to work. They're the they they don't help us either. So our own people are just as bad. Some of them don't put nothing in the pot. They shouldn't take nothing out. That's a, that's my opinion. But I don't believe that your figures are right if you do that for a living or not. Uh, I believe we've got uh, Ben Habib back. We've been trying to reconnect uh, with the former uh, UKIP uh, Brexit Party MEP, I should say, not UKIP, Brexit Party MEP, CEO of the First Property Group. Uh, ben, great to have you back online. You put 10p in the metre. You've been a victim of the uh, power cuts, no doubt. <laughs> um, do you think that if the Prime Minister goes, Brexit is in peril? Well, the question presupposes that Brexit is safe with the Prime Minister. And actually, I would argue that this Prime Minister has compromised the integrity of this country in the pursuit of being elected, and he hasn't actually delivered Brexit. It, you know, it, it, we, all, we all know now that Northern Ireland is a big constitutional issue. It's a big constitutional issue because it's effectively been left behind in the EU single market for goods. And... Uh, so pri the, the, Boris Johnson, actually, as I think 148 MPs in his own party have now uh, concluded, is a self-interested person in whom we cannot have confidence. He got elected on a, premise, uh, on a promise to get Brexit done, but in fact, he hasn't done it. He hasn't delivered his big central promise on page five of his manifesto, which was that the country would leave the EU as one united kingdom. We haven't done it. We have a constitutional crisis, which I think is going to come to a head next week if we believe that new legislation is going to be tabled to new to the Northern Ireland Protocol. But Boris Johnson, I think himself, is such a political expedient that he presents a clear and present danger to Brexit. He hasn't delivered it. He had an 80-seat majority to do it. He failed to do it. And now we are on the precipice of, uh, uh, of the whole thing collapsing. Um, however, I Prime Minister Jeremy Hunt or another Remainer Prime Minister in the mould of Theresa May would surely be worse. Uh, I, I can't agree that uh, Jeremy Hunt, I think, would just be an appalling Prime Minister, full stop, whether he's a Remainer Brexiteer or whatever. But I, uh, first of all, I don't think there's any chance that you would get an arch Remainer as Prime Minister. The majority of Tory party MPs right now are effectively Brexiteers. There are at least 134 Remain voting uh, Tory MPs, but they won't get to decide who the next prime minister is. But the question really is this. Can anyone be worse for the United Kingdom right now than Boris Johnson? And as far as Brexit is concerned, and virtually in all other dimensions, I don't think anyone else could be worse than him. You know, you've got someone who has willing, uh, intentionally or otherwise misled Parliament broken his own lockdown laws, hasn't delivered on his central manifesto promises. We're facing a constitutional crisis. We're facing a cost of living crisis. One of the issues, I was listening uh, intently to Charlie earlier, who said, you know, we've had 12 years of a conservative government. We haven't had real wage growth. We haven't had real GDP growth in 12 years. And one of the whole principles of Brexit, the underlying aim of Brexit, was to be able to deregulate and cut taxes. And we haven't done it. We haven't done it because we're tied at the hip to the EU. We're still in a lunar orbit of EU regulatory framework. The Prime Minister, through his trade and cooperation agreement, has signed up to a level playing field which prohibits us from actually deregulating and cutting taxes and reducing the cost of living in the United Kingdom. That's the problem. And by the way, while I'm at it, Mark, we are tied into net zero under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Even if the Prime Minister wanted to give up on his ridiculous Green New Revolution, he can't do it because he's committed to it in international treaty. If you don't believe me, read Article 7.2, Paragraph 4, page 202 of the TCA. This Prime Minister has undermined Brexit all the way through. Yes, he promised to get it delivered. That's how he got elected. 
but he hasn't done the job. So I think he's got to go and we've got to take our chances with someone else as a leader. And I do not believe that there are not good, good enough people in the Conservative Party on the back benches who couldn't lead this country better than he does, uh, he has, and deliver Brexit once and for all. Is that Prime Minister Ben Habib? No, it's not me. <laughs> it, it's not Habib. Who could it be, though? Is it uh, Prime Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg? Is it Liz Truss? J uh, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg voted for Theresa May's withdrawal agreement on the third vote. And so I've got a real question. Someone else was, you know, uh, banging Jacob Rees-Mogg's drum earlier. And, you know, if you take a cursory look at him, you do think you've got a, you've got a real, some, someone who really believes in the United Kingdom who would put the United Kingdom first. But how could anyone have voted for Theresa May's w, uh, WA3, you know, when it came around on the third time? So I've got a real question. And Boris Johnson voted for it too, by the way. So I've got a real question over Jacob Rees-Mogg. I think uh, e Esther McVeigh, she's fantastic. What's wrong with Esther McVeigh? She's terrific. Put her front and centre and give her, give her a shot at it. With you as her deputy. Um, Jonathan, ultimately, do you think Boris Johnson will survive his current political travails and fight the next election? Um, well, I, to be honest, I have no, no idea, and I'm not sure anyone else does either. Um, I'm an economist, not a pollster. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, so, so, so we'll see. I mean, I do think. Um, I mean, I think it's quite interesting what uh, Ben Habib said about the, uh, um, the you know, Boris Johnson's promise to to take us out of uh, the EU as one in uh, one entire country, and the Northern Ireland Pro Protocol undermines that. He's quite right, of course. The Northern Ireland Protocol does give Northern Ireland a very different status within the UK. Uh, very different status to the rest of the UK. Of course, Mr. Ben Habib, unlike anybody else on this panel, did actually vote for the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol. So he, along with Boris Johnson, shares full responsibility for the mess that we are currently in. Um, you know, uh, we promised <laughs> a deal. Well, well, Habib, if if, if, well, if you've, if Johnson, well, wait a minute, if you've done Johnson your homework, if you've Mr. done ben your Habib homework, Jonathan, chose to chose to endorse the Northern Ireland Protocol and claimed falsely that it would not lead to the mess, which unfortunately um, it has done. Um, but that is where we are, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, Jonathan, you know, you, Jonathan know you've done, you've done, you, yeah, you've done a modicum of homework, but you haven't done all your homework. Actually, if you go back to 2019 and you look at what I was saying in 2019, you will, it will be utterly clear to you, including my pinned tweet which is an interview with Sophie Ridge in November 2019, saying that the withdrawal agreement and the protocol in particular was worse than remaining because Northern Ireland would be left bereft. And I was sitting in it? the European, I was sitting in the European Parliament, having to, uh, w with virtually no voice, as the Brexit Party, in this difficult position, and we all grappled with it, I'm being completely frank with you, we all grappled with it, deciding whether we vote for something that we know is bad or we vote against Brexit and get accused by the nation of the, as the Brexit party that stood for democracy, watched a landslide victory for, for Boris Johnson on the back of this wretched agreement and voted against it. And if you've done your homework really well, okay, Jonathan, that, that, you'll also fine. be aware um, you that I wrote an article that, at the fine. time. I, I wrote an article all, at the time in which I, in which I justified my vote. You don't like very much. Can I just finish, Jonathan? Let, let you've challenged, Jonathan, in a sense, Jonathan, you've challenged my integrity. So you have to give me a right to respond. I wrote at the time okay. that I would be keeping a very, that, 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 that the agreement was a bad agreement that the Prime Minister had promised to put things right during the transition period, that we would be watching him intently, and that's precisely what I did. And on the 7th of March at the Bruges Group, I said, and I think I was one of the first people to say it, that the Northern Ireland Protocol has to be repudiated. And I warned on the 2nd of June 2020 in the Telegraph that actually the protocol was a constitutional problem in the brewing and that it was like a cuckoo's egg that had to be pushed out of the nest. I have done more to fight for the, uh, for the integrity of the United Kingdom, I think, than the vast majority of politicians who sit in Westminster, um, uh, including launching a judicial review. Um, you know, so I have underwritten 
a legal action against the protocol, which goes to the Supreme Court in November. I travel in hope that the Supreme Court will endorse our position. But the protocol is a clear and present danger to the Union of the United Kingdom. Sorry, I've really banged on, Mark, so forgive well, me. Well, no, I'll, that's I'll, fine. I'll You're entitled now. to defend yourself. Uh, absolutely. Back, back to me, please, if you can, Faye. Um, you are entitled to defend yourself. Uh, ben Habib there saying that he was uh, interviewed by Sophie Ridge. I don't know who she is. I'll have to Google that later. Um, <laughs> last, last word from Bobby George, a darts legend. Um, Bobby, if you had your vote again, given your concerns about the border and the people coming into this country, would you vote Brexit this time round? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I don't think it, if you, if I voted that, then it, I'll be telling porkies, wouldn't I? I wouldn't be keeping to me word. So, anyway, what, what annoys me, I'm not, I'm, I don't mind, I don't mind if you uh, tell me off this, um, Mark. Yeah. All the bad things they say about Boris Johnson, that I haven't heard anyone mention all the good things he's done. He had a lot, for a prime minister, he came in, he had Brexit, and that was all, that was a, all paperwork and going backwards and forwards. And then he had the, the, um, the COVID. He had all that problems. Then he didn't have any lorry drivers. He had that problems. Now he's got a problem because he had a cake and a cup of tea at a party. I mean, it, you know, all the things he's done, um, no one praises him from. It's all the things he hasn't done. And that's, I don't think anyone would have done any better than he done. Fair enough. Uh, last word to uh, Jonathan Portes. Your final thoughts on this debate? Um, well, I mean, I think, um, as I said, uh, you know, as far as our relationship with the EU goes, um, Johnson has got us stuck. We can't go forward. We can't go back. Um, if we want to make a success of Brexit, as I hope we all do, um, that requires establishing a constructive relationship with our largest trading partner. Um, that's not going to be possible with Boris Johnson. I hope that whoever is our next prime minister, whoever is the next government, um, that they will be able to re, uh, to reestablish that constructive economic and trading partnership. That means negotiating uh, um, uh, a resolution to the problems over the Northern Ireland Protocol. It means ver doing various other things that actually let UK businesses um, get back to trading with Europe um, on a on a sensible basis. All that is possible. All that is doable. It's not very sexy. It's not very political. It's not you know. It's all complicated stuff. But it can be done. Um, it will happen at some point. Maybe not this year. Maybe not next year. But sometime in the next decade. That doesn't mean a reversal of Brexit. But it is essential if we actually want Brexit to work. Gentlemen, thank you for a fascinating debate. The CEO of First Property Group, former Brexit Party MEP, Ben Habib. Also, darts legend remains supporting Bobby George. Great to see you again, Bobby. And a welcome return to the show to Professor of Economics and Public Policy at King's College London, Jonathan Portes. What do you think, Mark, at GBnews.uk? If Boris goes, is it game over for Brexit? Well, lots more to come. Comedy legend Duncan Norvell is live at 10 o'clock. Plus, another monologue is on its way. My take at 10, I'll be dealing with Ben & Jerry's and their fish food ice cream, which smells a bit fishy to me. But next up in the news agenda with my panel, is Keir Starmer simply too boring to become Prime Minister? See you in two. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs>
whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online every morning. It's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, and the left fights the right, and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Is Brexit safe without Boris Johnson? Uh, this from, let's have a look. Uh, it is from Alan, who says, step up to the crease, Lord Frost, now. Uh, lots of people have said that. Uh, Mr Portes, your economist guest, is typical of the genre, pretending Brexit is safe whilst all the while plotting to take us back in under the disguise of renegotiating the relationship. Lots more of your brilliant emails to come. Uh, but let's get to the Labour Party now. Angela Rayner has reignited rumours of a rift with Keir Starmer after saying that he needs to put some welly into his speeches and that he looks and sounds too much like a lawyer in public appearances. It comes after he was criticised for a lacklustre performance during PMQs this week, which came just two days after Boris Johnson narrowly survived a confidence vote by his own MPs, a topic that Starmer didn't even touch on. Rayner added that she would have been a lot more robust with the Prime Minister had she been on the other side of the dispatch box. So, is Keir Starmer quite simply too boring to be Prime Minister? Francine. Well, we have had so many big characters, haven't we? You know, we're used to Donald Trump and, and Boris is a great character. By the way, you're a great impressionist. Have you ever done the Donalds? <laughs> I don't actually do the men, but so many Well, I men don't think do... you've got the hair for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't got the hair for it. But um, he's very, you know, you're tall, you know. I, I don't actually do him, but there you go. So I won't, I won't that was decent. I won't that say. wasn't bad. But, Interesting. You know, he... It, as crazy as he was, and I, I did find him entertaining. I find mm. Boris entertaining, and I think we're used to that now. So, mm. yeah, maybe he is too boring, you know. Um, but we also need somebody who is smart and honest, you know, like we were discussing mm. before, and that is important as well. But, um, yeah, I do, I do like a character. I think we just got used to it. Mm. Uh, is this man, you know, clearly he's got a brain on him, Neil. Yep. He's an experienced public servant, top yep. lawyer back in the day. But he seems to lack, no pun intended, the X factor. Yeah. I mean, look, he, he isn't the... It was Popeye. Is he your Popeye? No, 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 but you know what? He, he, look, you should no. take the credit. You invented that genre. <laughs> he is not the most charismatic speaker. He's not... He should have actually destroyed Johnson, really. I think that was a... You know, he, he missed a massive goal. opportunity, really, there. But, but here lies the problem, isn't it? Our big politicians and our prime ministers, do we want them to be celebrities? Do, they, do we want them to be on Instagram? Do we want them to be cool? Do we want them to be making funny impressions? I just want someone who's smart honest, knows what they're doing and can actually deliver. Mm. That's what we need, right? And I think here lies the problem with a lot of politicians now. They just don't know what actually they need to be doing. Social media, again, and the media, like you guys, we want them to be big entertainers. And Boris is great and mad and fun and a buffoon and la-la-la. I don't give a monkey's. Just please be honest. Please, if you make rules, stick to them. Please deliver what you're going to say. I mean, here lies the problem. They're not entertainers. You know, Simon Cowell is an entertainer. Francie is an entertainer. They're on ITV. They do mainstream entertainment shows. This, this is the Prime Minister. And I want... So, Keir Starmer, if he wants to be a credible, a credible opposition, actually, just be really good at perhaps nailing Mr Johnson in Prime Minister's Question Time. Be good at what your job is. But I don't, I don't, need, don't need him to be funny. He doesn't have to be witty. He doesn't mm. have to look cool. Just be good. Also, is Keir Starmer's, uh, you know, he's widely considered to lack charisma. Is that a red herring? Is the issue with Starmer not the lack of charisma, but the lack of policy? 
that this guy is the ultimate fence sitter. Is that the real problem with Starmer? I think that's that's a, a, a big problem actually. With a, a lot of politicians, can't, can't, define, can't define what a woman well, is. Yeah, they're just terrified to actually say what they think, mm -hmm. and so the public, we're, we're sitting there going, just please give us an honest answer. If you know what a woman is, just say, I'm sorry, I don't agree. With this, we know a lot of this has come out of mm. some of the issues with transgender, and and th there's a, this big debate and a really big, on, serious discussion going on about that. But you have to actually know what a woman is and not be afraid to say it. It comes back to what we were saying earlier about having, you know, female-free web pages on the NHS, yeah. you know, for, for people with, you know people with ovaries, you kind of go, sometimes you go, this is nonsense, we just need to speak plain English again, have some politicians that speak plain English. And in a way, people like Thatcher in her era, but of course, they didn't have social media, they didn't have all this noise coming from every yeah. single direction to actually distract them and make them think and have people advise us going, hang on, careful, there are some people really giving you a hard time here. Charlie, we'll return to this clocks against us, but briefly, uh, is this a problem for Starmer of policy or personality? Personality. We don't need massive entertainers. I think the, the general public don't actually want entertainers. They want someone they can have a pint with. Boris Johnson, you can go out in the pub with him and have a nice time. His son will bore you to tears. Yeah, any problem is Boris Johnson will go home with your wife and then you'll be in trouble. <laughs> uh, lots more to come, particularly from Charlie Peters, cutting his prime there, but lots to come. I'll be dealing with Ben and Jerry's in a mini monologue next, plus Duncan Norvell, cancelled comedy star in Mark Meets. See you soon. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. It's 10 o'clock and this is Mark Dolan tonight. My Mark Meets guest is cancelled comedy legend Duncan Norvell. Find out why he's been cancelled shortly. It's an absolute disgrace. In the news agenda with my panel, uh, we're going to talk about the internet. Is it left-wing? Apparently, Google searches uh, suggest that it is. Also, can you be friends with your neighbours? And why are women now under pressure to remove all, and I mean all, of their body hair. Plus, tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30. And of course, ladies and gentlemen, we've got another take at 10. That's right, a mini monologue. Tonight, I will be dealing with this. That's right, it is Ben and Jerry's getting involved in our border policy. My first public comments. You won't want to miss them. But first up, the headlines with Ray. Thanks, Mark. Here's the latest from the GB Newsroom. 
Campaign groups say they'll keep fighting after losing a high court bid to stop the government from flying migrants to Rwanda. It comes after a judge denied legal challenges, with lawyers arguing that the plans were not safe. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, welcomed the decision, saying it would help to break the business model of ruthless people traffickers. Around 31 migrants are now due on the first flight next Tuesday. However, the judge has granted permission to appeal. That could be heard as early as Monday. James Nicholl, a trustee for Care for Calais, has called it a brutal policy. These are people who come in who are from war-torn countries, who are already traumatised. It simply adds to the agony and causes more trauma. It is an absolute scandal. Ukraine's foreign minister says they will work with Britain to ensure the release of two men sentenced to death in the separatist region of Donetsk. Aidan Aslin and Sean Pinner, both British citizens, were found guilty of mercenary activities by a Russian-led court there. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss described the verdict as a sham. Boris Johnson has ordered ministers to do everything in their power to bring them home. Deputy Director for Research at Amnesty International, Denis Krivoshev, says Russia must respect the men's rights. This is not a trial. There should be no decision which is called death penalty, which it isn't, even isn't. And they should be treated as any prisoners of war under the Geneva Conventions. None of that is happening. That's what must happen. So cancel that decision. Don't pretend it's a trial and provide them with their rights, which they have as prisoners of war. Sir Keir Starmer says Labour will vote against the government plan to override elements of the Northern Ireland Protocol when it's brought to the Commons on Monday. After meeting with political leaders in Northern Ireland, Sir Keir said he believes the deadlock over power sharing can be resolved through negotiation. The DUP is refusing to form an executive in protest against the protocol. A recording of an ex-soldier telling a 999 operator that he'd killed his neighbours has been released. Neighbours been stabbed by who? By me. By you? Yes. Jurors at Bristol Crown Court heard the clip where Colin Reeves admitted stabbing Jennifer and Stephen Chappell to death in November last year. Other footage appears to show the neighbours clashing over a parking space that was taken 10 days before the ex-commando killed the couple at their home in Somerset. Reeves has denied murder but admitted manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility. On TV, online and on DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now back to Mark Dolan tonight. There we are. Are you enjoying the hologram? We are very good at special effects here on Mark Dolan tonight. There you go. I'm in vision with orange makeup, courtesy of the brilliant Tamara. Now, big stories, big guests and big opinions in this hour. Remember, we don't do boring, not on my watch. I just won't have it. In the news agenda with my panel is the internet left wing. Can you be friends with your neighbours? And why are women now under pressure to remove all of their body hair? And I mean all of their body hair. Plus, we've got another topical game show and tomorrow's papers at exactly 10.30 sharp and full panel reaction. But first, it's time for this. Welcome to Bonkers 2022, when ice cream giant Ben and Jerry's have a view on the government's border policy. They've sent the following tweets this week in objection to the policy of processing asylum applications in Rwanda. Here's what they wrote. Listen up, folks, because we need to talk about Pretty Patel's ugly Rwanda plan and what this means. Most people are kind and compassionate, right? Yet our government's plan to forcibly send people to a country thousands of miles away simply for seeking refuge in the UK is cruel and morally bankrupt. Now, this policy may not be for everyone, and it may not work, who knows, but it's an attempt to break up an evil, evil business model in which gangsters take thousands from desperate people to make this perilous crossing. And it's an attempt to end what is effectively a daily humanitarian crisis. 
But I don't buy any of this woke posturing from Ben and Jerry's. Let me tell you that corporations don't have a heart. They're not trying to make the world a better place. And they certainly don't care about your well-being, particularly the processed food industry. All they care about is the image of their brand and making money. The problem is that the more money Ben and Jerry's make, the sicker we will get because they sell a product which is comprised of fat and sugar. This calorific insulin spiking slurry is linked with tooth decay, obesity and God knows what else. And if eaten too often is particularly bad for kids. Taking lectures from junk food giant Ben and Jerry's on human well-being is like taking lectures from Saddam Hussein on human rights. The only thing Ben and Jerry's specialise in is making you fat. Forget about terrorism, war, pollution and climate change. The very greatest threat to humanity in the world today is so-called metabolic disease. Type 2 diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity, all linked to products like this stuff. It's my view that Ben and Jerry's are entering a rocky road by being so political. The views of any poor co corporation should be vanilla at best, but they've clearly got a chocolate chip on their shoulder. But don't be fooled by this minted corporation who make plenty of cookie dough themselves. For the makers of the famous fish food flavour, all of this is distinctly fishy. This empty virtue signalling nonsense is enough to make you want to eye scream. Now, let's have a taste, shall we? Yuck. That's just the brown stuff. I'll be cleaning that mess up later in the show, but it's time now for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, showbiz, sport, business and beyond. Tonight, comedy legend Duncan Norvell, famous for the catchphrase, chase me. Born in Loughborough, Duncan Norvell, is born out of the finest tradition of variety theatre and was a fixture on our TVs throughout the 80s. He presented the original version of Blind Date, appeared in Through the Keyhole and countless other TV hits. However, Duncan was hospitalised in 2012 after suffering a stroke, leaving him paralysed down the left side of his body. Since then, he has been a high-profile supporter of the Stroke Association. His brilliant recovery wasn't enough to see a recent show cancelled by a venue in Staffordshire. Because apparently he's too slow and wheelchair bound, something that Duncan refutes. It seems no one is immune from the cancel culture. But I'm delighted to say that joining me now, uncancelled this evening, is the hugely talented comedy icon, Duncan Norvell. Hey, Duncan. Hello, Mark. How are you? Very well, great to see Hello. you. Were you really cancelled by this gig because of your health? Um, yes. They, uh, somebody had shown the committee a picture of me in my wheelchair and uh, explained to them, I don't know whether he'll be able to do the show. Um, I'd done one or two shows before this actual show came in. Uh, I'd done a big charity event at Circus Tavern in Perfleet, and I, I was able to get out of my wheelchair and and walk around a few steps, you know. Mm. And uh, I knew I'd be able to work this particular place and work it well because I just do the wheelchair. The only thing I don't do now is is run around because I can. So chase me. I've had to change the catchphrase to push me. So um, that's that, Mark. That is brilliant. Yeah, walk, walk slowly after me. And and uh, their their explanation at this venue is that they don't have wheelchair access, and they apologise for any confusion. But the bottom line is that you do not perform in a wheelchair. No, no, I, I go on in the wheelchair just so I can be pushed on mm. to the stage. I have a head mic, 
so I don't have to hold another mic. So I've got me right hand three for me walking stick. And I can actually walk along and talk into the head mic where the mic comes around here and directly in front of my mouth. Yeah. So the act is the same apart from me running around and going in and out the audience like I used to do. Uh, it's and, not a uh, very inclusive I'm... policy, is it? Pardon? It's not a very inclusive policy, cancelling you for a gig because of your physical condition. It seems unfair. Oh, very unfair. I mean, they were still selling tickets the day, the day I was on, right up until 7 o'clock at night. They were still selling tickets to, to, for, the, for the show. Um, and one of my friends had come to watch me there. He went to the bar to get a drink. And somebody said, have you come to see Duncan Norvell? This was one of the people working behind the bar. Mm. And he says, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. He says, well, he's not on tonight. He's had a heart attack. And that's what they were told, um, which is a bit, bit wrong, isn't it? Duncan, is there anything else going on here? Have you been cancelled because of the nature of your act? Is this an excuse, do you think? Um, yes, I do. What do you think's going on? What is it about your act that they might object to? I thought you were toast to that. Um, what audience? Well, I don't, I don't actually know. Uh, my act was a little bit campish. Perhaps they... Uh, they, they obviously haven't seen me before they booked me, that's for sure. Um, and I don't know if they knew that most of my act was to do with running in and out the audience, you know, asking them to chase me, really. Yeah. I mean, and you know, uh, your, your uh, lovely wife, Linda, who also helps you in your, in your job, she was none too happy. Uh, no, not really. We drove up from London, which was three hours, and uh, you know it's a, a long, a long trip to go there, only to be told uh, you can't work. We're not going to let you go on because uh, we're not insured for people in a wheelchair. I said, "Well, I'm not going to be, you know, messing about on the wheelchair." I, I'm I'm just going to do my act. I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. I'm insured, even if you aren't. Yeah. Which you should be. Um, and I, I, I was just gutted, and yet they were still selling the tickets. Yeah. I mean, it was sold out. It was sold out, and uh, so I hope they gave everybody the money back in Rugeley. It was in Staffordshire. Mm -hmm. I hope they all got the money back, uh, even though there was a, a two or three acts on the show as well. Yeah. And they were they they would have put those on and just they said I'd had a heart attack. Very, very strange that they would make up what was clearly a lie. You are the picture of health, Duncan. You look fantastic. And you're a very popular comedian. Yeah, you know, you. you're an icon of of, of comedy. And, uh, and a big audience still wanting to see your stuff. Have you been the victim of cancel culture before, do you think? Uh, no, I haven't, no. No. I've never had a show cancel. Good. Well, I'm, no. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Never in 40 years. Well, uh, let's, let's talk uh, about your, your amazing career, Duncan. What a career it's been. How did you get into comedy? Um, I think it must have been my father because he was a he was a funny man. Um, he he could tell a gag. He was great at telling gags. His timing was good. And um, through from there, I went I went away once with, to Bournemouth. The first show I ever did. It was a charity. No, it wasn't a charity. It was a 
a competition, a talent competition. Oh, wow. In Bournemouth, at Boscombe Pier, it was. And uh, my friend who I went with, he put my name forward. And I was sat there, and I heard him, the compere saying, next we have an impressionist, comedian impressionist from Leicestershire. Would you please welcome on stage Mr. Duncan? Oh, we've just lost the line Duncan to Duncan. Bell. Oh, he's back. And before I could open my mouth, he'd shoved me out the chair. Yeah. <laughs> he's still ever. Yeah, and the, the, rest, the rest is history. Um, how did the catchphrase chase me, chase me come about? Oh, that happened in a club in Glasgow many years back. And uh, it was a working men's club. And I was on stage and I, I go into the audience, as I told you, and I picked up this guy's drink. And I <laughs> said to him in the voice of Michael Crawford, I said, uh, is your house lined with all this new foam? in the ceiling and the walls. And he said, no. I says, well, in that case, you could be losing this much every week. And I took his pint and I just drunk it straight down. And uh, he just looked at me as if he was going to kill me. And I just went, oh, go on, chase me. And I ran off. And when I come back, eventually, about 20 minutes later, I come back, he'd calmed down, and everybody was still laughing. And I thought, oh, that's funny, that. And I said to him, I said to him, go on, chase me again, because I'd, I'd drunk another beer. <laughs> well, after three or four times, I'd done this. But I always got him one back. I'd get a waiter to bring the drink back. It was a way of having a drink on stage. And uh, then it just turned into a massive catchphrase. I mean, it was uh, the best ones, I think, come natural. Yeah. You know. Well, I just remember your your winning smile and you're a great looking guy, so much charisma. I think you've got that Tommy Cooper quality where people are laughing at you, whatever you do. There's just, I think you've got funny bones, Duncan. Thank you. I have now, <laughs> after my stroke. See what I mean? Yeah, um, I, Duncan, I, listen, how are you feeling at the moment? It's very clear that you are fit for live performance, which is why your cancellation is a disgrace. Um, you had a stroke. Was it in 2012? Yes. All right. Yeah. And that was devastating, wasn't it, at the time? You lost, you lost feeling in one half of your body. Yeah, I lost it to my left, left-hand side. I had the stroke in the right side of my brain, but it affects the left side. It's opposite. Right. If you open in the left, it affects your right side. Yeah. And I had it in the right side, which, if there's anything good about it, that was great for me because, obviously, I'm right-handed. And with me using a stick, I can hold the stick in the right. If I'd have had it in the left and this arm, I mean, in the right and the in the left and this one had gone, I wouldn't have been able to hold a stick mark. Yeah. Um, obviously, the rehab has worked and you've achieved a full recovery, Duncan. Well, it's uh, still ongoing, Mark. You know, I mean, I've got to try and get this, some movement in this left arm. <laughs> but it's uh, just take a long, long time, you know. it's uh, It helps when you've got somebody to help you, like I've got my partner, Lynn, and uh, she's had a lot to put up with. <laughs> yes, but and, she's married um, to Duncan, she... Duncan Norvell. It can't be too bad. Um, Duncan, um, can I ask you what you think of modern comedy and what you think of politically correct comedy or woke comedy, as it's called? Yeah. Um, well, the comedy I was brought up with, I was... Those people aren't around anymore. I mean, the great Les Dawson, and you've got people like Ken Dodd. Um, you had the double acts with Cannonball. Then uh, there was one or two. Michael Barrymore was brilliant. Um, and the ones of today, I just feel that they, they, it's not, they come on as if they don't care what they say. 
or if they're funny or not. They just comes out of the mouth, just a foul language, most of them. Mm. And I think to myself, I think the public don't want that, not of my age group anyway. Um, and they all talk about it when you talk to somebody in the street, you know. But there is some good, good that they so say alternate comedy acts out there. There's some cracking ones. I mean, Michael McIntyre, I'm a big fan. He's clean, he's funny, observational comedy is excellent. And Peter Kay, well, you won't find anybody funnier, I don't think. Um, and I do like one or two of the uh, new ones that have come along quite quick. Simon Evans is a wonderful guy from Brighton. You've well, he seen is. seen him, check him out. And, and Simon Evans is a and, presenter of Headliners, our late-night newspaper review show, Duncan. Uh, well, look, it's such a privilege to have you on the show. The clock is against us. You are officially uncancelled by GB News. You can come on this programme <laughs> whenever you want, wheelchair or no wheelchair. Yeah, when you're in program. London, do, do come and see us in the studio. Um, very briefly, yeah, Duncan, like how can people find out about your next shows? Um... The best uh, at the moment, I'm looking for a good manager. <laughs> I should have had one 15 years ago, but I didn't. But I could do with one now uh, that can get get me uh, on telly more. So, uh, but you can actually get me on my own uh, website, and there's there'll be uh, dates going up there where you can see me. I've got Thanks. I've got one or two. Thanks. And, and on Facebook, you can get me. Well, there you go. And we've also got Duncan Chase Me on Twitter. And I have just followed you, Duncan. Such a privilege to have you on the Thank show. Many well. thanks to Lynn as well. Yeah. And you'll, you'll always be uncancelled in my book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, brilliant stuff. My sincere thanks to Duncan Norvell. Brilliant stuff. Well, lots more to come in the news agenda with my panel. Is the internet left wing? That's a question we'll be asking uh, in the next section of the programme. Also, can you be friends with your neighbours and why are modern women under pressure to remove all of their body hair? Plus, we've got another great British game show coming up and a bang on 10.30, the papers don't go anywhere. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was in fact a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fact! Naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News.
Welcome back to Mark Dolan tonight. Uh, on Sunday, uh, we will be celebrating a year of GB News because Sunday is the eve of a year of our brand new news channel. I'll be talking about it at exactly nine o'clock and we'll be reflecting on the 12 months that have been and gone. And uh, something I'll be picking up on is the amazing emails and also letters and gifts that you send in. And I've received a couple of gifts this week for which I'm extremely grateful and you'll hear more about that on Sunday. Now, Google has become the latest in a long line of big corporations being accused of political bias after analysis showed it promotes far more news stories from left-wing media outlets than those on the right. An audit carried out by the Daily Mail revealed that web searches for Boris Johnson give far more results for news sites that are hostile to the PM. The Guardian came up 38 times in the search results, the Independent 14 times, yet the Daily Telegraph came up just on four occasions. The Daily Express three times and the Mail Online twice. Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries responded to the research by saying it proved what many had feared and promised action in a forthcoming bill to address unfair bias and distortion. So it begs the question, is the internet left-wing? Charlie Peters. Uh, it definitely is, but I'm not entirely sure about this project they've got here. It certainly seems to me to be the case that if you Google Boris Johnson now, you're probably going to find more negative and hostile coverage at the minute. Yeah. I mean, if you tried maybe uh, two years ago, I mean, even The Guardian would have to, you know, bow down and accept he was on the right track. Mm. But nowadays, it's very difficult, I think, to find positive coverage of, of the Prime Minister, even The Telegraph, which is a... I mean, let's be honest, essentially, um, you know, the party's um, production organ for, for good comms and media, <laughs> it's, not, it's struggling to find the right line to take, and I think is uh, battling his cabinet very fiercely. But, you know, mm. the bigger question, is the internet too left-wing? Yes, because, generally speaking, internet users tend to be younger, they tend to be more, tend to be more intelligent, they tend to be more educated, and I think all of these things generally and correlate... what you mean by that is, you don't mean that they're better than... You know, people that. Uh, oh, not, no, it's not a moral value. No, it's not a moral it's, value. It, 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 they've been to university. There we go, yeah. They've got sure. those values. Sure, it's not, it's, not, it's not necessarily. I'm not judging people as mm. uh, better than other people because they've been uh, educated at university. I actually tend to do the opposite. It's just the case that you find more of these people online and therefore you'll find a uh, kind of an audience skew towards the left because of that. Yes, and of course, the social media giants have been accused of a left wing bias, whether it's Twitter, Facebook or Instagram, one of the reasons why Elon Musk wants to buy Twitter, just to balance its politics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when people go on these websites, what they generally want when they're looking for discussion is all sides covered, freedom for all people mm. to engage in the discussion. They don't want to know, uh, as they are discovering now, I think, that some of the more important and even actually um, the rarest and more challenging voices are being snuffed out of the conversation altogether because people who work high up in these organisations don't think people should be allowed to hear it. It's a very dangerous thing. And now, of course, these are private organisations. They can do what they want in terms of how they organise their audiences, how they organise their policies. But I think we have to come to accept that websites like Twitter, like Facebook, they're part of, um, they're part of the public discussion now. Any conversation that happens in public yeah. will also happen online. Yep. And so there has to be some expectation that the rules of free speech and fairness and access to all voices don't just happen outside and on the street, but also online too. Well, yes, uh, we've got the papers, which are full of critical stories about Boris Johnson. We're coming to those in just a couple of seconds' time. How do we fix this? How do we make the internet more politically balanced? Well, I mean, the dream this is happening right now with Twitter. We're having someone who believes in free speech attempting to take it over. What it really needs is actually um, some leadership and some scrutiny on the tech giants and the people who run them. All too often, I think, we talk about meddling with them and trying to reorganise their policies through the government. What I really want is some of the bolder thinkers in our society, some of the bolder tech people, to come out and say, yes, do you know what? I believe in freedom and openness, and I'm willing to take a stand and promote free speech. That's what Elon's doing. And obviously, it's caused a ginormous reaction mm. because the people who can control the conversations mm. are very distressed to find out that the power's not in their hands anymore. Elon, mm. first name terms. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag best buddy. Uh, well, it is exactly 10.30 every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. We bring you the papers. And so let's crack on with tomorrow's front pages. Here they are, hot off the press. We'll start with the I newspaper with quite a political scoop. Tory rebels in new plot to unseat Johnson. Boris Johnson faces a new threat to his premiership as backbenchers mobilise the grassroots. Rebels are set to exploit a party loophole used by Jacob Rees-Mogg to help oust Theresa May. The plan relies on 65 local Tory chairmen 
to hold general meetings and vote against the PM. Plotters are hunting for a Johnson successor, with Nadim Zahawi viewed as the unity candidate. A boost for number 10 and the Home Office, however, as the High Court rules the Rwanda deportation flight can leave. But the Prime Minister is under pressure to act over two Britons facing the death penalty for fighting Russia. But there you go. This issue around the Prime Minister and his grip on power is not going away, Francine. Um, we'll, we'll discuss that in just a moment, because let me give you the other front pages first. Forgive me. Um, FT Weekend. Johnson snubs food shake-up in bid to keep right-wingers on side. Um, Dimblesby, Dimbleby's big proposal dropped. Sugar and salt tax vetoed. Fears for extra price rises. So this was the idea that the Prime Minister would veto uh, nanny state junk food taxes in order to improve obesity. But it seems the Prime Minister will make sure that food of all types remains as cheap as possible. Highest US inflation in four decades piles pressure on the Fed to tighten hard in America. Daily Star next. Britney Spears' ex-hubby crashes singer's big day. Britney Spears married uh, Sam Ashari in a star-studded bash that was gate-crashed by her first hubby, Jason Alexander. And scenes... Uh, absolutely played out at the wedding with security guards wrestling her ex to the ground, presumably detained by the authorities later on. Uh, next up, the Daily Express. Rush for last-minute staycation bookings as flight misery hots up. Let's stay home. Surge in UK holidays as travel chaos bites. Mm. Daily Mail. Charles attacks appalling Rwanda scheme. Prince Charles has privately condemned Priti Patel's Rwanda asylum plan, risking a major clash with number 10. The Prince of Wales is understood to have said that giving Channel migrants a one-way ticket to Africa was appalling. But a High Court judge last night threw out a bid to halt the first charter flight to Rwanda due to take off on Tuesday. Uh, the Guardian next. PM's food strategy, a huge missed opportunity. No mention of sugar tax or plans to reduce meat and dairy in leaked paper. OK, next up, we've got the Telegraph here, and I have it in my humble possession. And there is your front page. PM's plan to grow for Britain. That's right, the Prime Minister spearheading what he hopes will be a strong economic Recovery, and those are your front pages. Uh, let's start with the I newspaper. And Francine, I wanted to come to you just a moment ago. The Prime Minister seemingly still under pressure. Yes, the Prime Minister is under pressure. And uh, the thing is, I like we've been discussing before. You mm. know, I'm I'm a bit of a fan of Boris Johnson, uh, and I've always said he's damned if he does, he's damned if he, he came into you know he came to being prime minister a really tough time. He's you know Brexit, COVID, um, and I know he's made mistakes. I know he's you know not been totally honest with us, and we've all been. But I always think it's better the devil you know. Um, so I kind of hope that he stays where he is. Well, I wonder, and Neil, I heard what you were saying earlier about how we just need a prime minister that's straight with the British people, yep. he's got clear policies, and he's going to lead from the front because we are emerging from an economic crisis, a health crisis mm. as well. Uh, we need a steady hand at the tiller. Yep. Uh, we can debate all day long whether Boris Johnson is that person. At the moment, he's the devil we know. Does the country need a leadership election? Well, I don't think it does, really. I think what we need is some stability right now. Mm. And it was interesting, last week, the country felt stable over that Jubilee weekend. And in a way, I would say, yeah. it, you just see what the Queen has managed to do in all that time. We've had that beautiful stability and calmness, and you feel... That was four days of loveliness, and then we went back to sort of madness on Monday again. And you feel, yeah, we just want some stability. So do we want another election? You know, we had, obviously, <laughs> David Cameron, right? They met Theresa May, and now Boris Johnson. Do we want another one? Not really, no. But if he's not the right man for the job and the country and his MPs, his own MPs, have lost mm. faith, maybe it's time to go, OK, 
I need to go rather than be pushed. Because you feel it's not if but when now. We're getting close to that point now where you feel this actually is sort of, um, it, you can't maintain it. He can't just bluff his way through it. He can't just kiss a cow on one of the front pages here <laughs> or grab a beer and be down the pub and sort of do some, oh, you know, Boris thing and suddenly everything's OK. Sorry, well, yeah, I'm referring let's, uh, to let's the have a look. Let's have a look kissing at that. a cow. A very moving picture, apparently, <laughs> I think was the headline. <laughs> but it's Good work. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, is, is kissing a cow the new kissing a baby? Well, it, do you know what? It, it, it's a good picture opportunity and Boris has been brilliant when he was the mayor and then when he's been PM at finding the great photo opportunity, whether it's flying a Union Jack, being stuck on some wire, you know, with a crazy hat. He's been brilliant at it. But maybe that's not what we need right now. I don't know. I mean, the bottom line, Charlie, is there is no obvious alternative to the Prime Minister. I think Rishi Sunak, before it was revealed that his wife is a billionaire, mm. was the heir apparent. Mm. Uh, but since then, you know, he's had a pretty bad press. And, of course, even today, the papers were, were talking about how, well, they accuse him of losing 11 billion quid by not ensuring the country against sure. r a rise in interest rates. Yes, people are finally turning their eyes on Rishi Sunak for once. They are. I mean, I don't know whether it's a witch hunt, whether he's truly accountable for 11, 11 billion quid wasted, <laughs> but there isn't an obvious person waiting in the wings, is there? No. Well, we're on the C team by now, after the fifth or sixth governmental iteration of the Conservative Party after mm. 12 years of power. Who's left? No one particularly great. And I think that's the only thing keeping him in power right now. They know there's no one left. But, you know, we're talking about animals now and that lovely photo on the front page. Uh, he is a wounded animal, Boris Johnson. And when, when you're dying, when you're fighting, you should have that shot of adrenaline, that fight or flight moment. And he's in it right now. Yeah. And what have we seen? dull, boring policies, generally pointless things. Was it the announcement this week that you can now have a 98% mortgage? That's not what we're going to need to kind of kickstart the country into supporting him. We need radical action, some huge attempts to grow the economy, something to actually change in order to keep him in power. Well, Stability would be nice, but actually some really exciting policies would do more than anything to keep him safe. What we need, uh, and this alludes to an email from earlier in the show mm. from one mm. of my viewers. We need Lord Frost. <laughs> well, I, I, I would enormously support him. I don't think his his uh, his public standing is big enough to challenge Boris Johnson. And he hasn't now. got a seat. Well, well, that also will let you down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but perhaps in time. And uh, Francine, interesting story in the Guardian about the Prime Minister ditching sugar taxes. Look, I'm the greatest critic of junk food, mm. as I might have demonstrated in my <laughs> Take at 10 with the Ben & Jerry's ice cream. Uh, but I do wonder whether it's a hard sell, the idea of making any food more expensive at the moment. I don't think we can make any food more expensive than it is already. I mean, God, shopping bills now is crazy. I, I'm, compared to a couple of years ago, I, I find myself spending so much more now on, on food. I can have one bag of shopping and it's like, you know, nearly... Eighty pounds, and I think how, but it's most of just... that's booze, though, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It's... The waitress, you know, Grigio. <laughs> the inflation, It'll get it's, just, you. It's, it's become. It Jacob's has become group. crazy, and it's very, very difficult now. Well, to... it, well it really is. And, and then... you know, what about when you want to eat organic food and and really good food? It's, good it's becoming yeah. really, really difficult. Well, yes, and and well, what uh, the Guardian are pointing out is that this sort of proposed sugar tax has been ditched for the time being. Uh, the Prime Minister, man of the people, he's just never going to sell a policy like that at the moment, is he? I don't think so. No. I really don't. Uh, however, the only issue, Neil, is it does kick the issue of public health it kicks the can mm. down the road, doesn't it? It does really. Look, it's a, it's a massive problem, obesity and bad health in kids now. You know, the... the um, the rates of really overweight kids are just going up and up. No, and they're it, not. And that's terrifying. I don't think they are. I think they're around the same as they have been for 20 years. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think there's there's way too much panic about obesity in this country. I know that this is a hobby horse of marks, and he'll, no, no, no. he'll help me. I'm about to get it. No, but by all, <laughs> means, by all means, I, I don't back. think that... But I'd say I don't think you're right on that one. I think, you know, the statistics show that it is a, an increasing problem. And, of course, you know, that really get, gets pushed down the line. The National Health have to pick up the problems. They, they have to be the ones that... Are I say it, Charlie, line. can't you just see that we are fatter? No, I, th I think the opposite is true. I think, generally speaking, people are quite healthy. And, and Why the, do you look at me? The fat... <laughs> you? <laughs> you, you, you? Your body's a temple. But, I mean, I, I've got to agree with you, Chris, actually, I, I, Charlie. More people are exercising yes, now, I think more that's people true. are in gym. But also, but also if, we're being, if we're being... Take the, the logical conclusion of what you just said, Neil, about yep. the, the health, self is, health service picking up the bill. Yeah. Um, 
the biggest cost in health is social care. And so if you're um, drinking loads, smoking loads, getting really overweight, you'll probably die in your 60s. And then uh, you won't have a, a huge I bill to look after in your 80s. If, you, if, for example, you've got type 2 diabetes, which is largely a lifestyle-related condition, mm. uh, you will live for a long time and very expensively. I think... Because it requires huge management. Yeah, That's I think right. in, the, in the final analysis, I think it's been shown that, generally speaking, unhealthiness is good for the coffers uh, insofar as socialised health care is less... We're less reliant on it. But, look, I mean, I think we should have a healthier country. Um, yep. And especially during the COVID lockdown, we found that lots of people were dying who shouldn't have been dying. And that caused a lot of us a lot of, you know, struggle as we had to change our lifestyles to adapt to that situation. But I don't think paternalism and taxing mm. is the way to achieve that. Well, uh, certainly not at the moment. No, but absolutely. It just feels, with everything going on, it no. just feels yeah. like something we do not need right no, now. No, I think that's fair enough. Um, Tom, are we ready with the times? OK, let's get the, uh, let's get the still um, just shortly uh, ready because I want to come to the holiday story in the Daily Express. Let's stay home. Surge in UK holidays as travel chaos bites. Mm. Neil, what is the point in going abroad these days? Well, there are problems. I mean, my, my wife, has, uh, she's a yoga teacher and she um, is abroad at the moment teaching a retreat. And the problems mm. of getting people out there, my son has just finished uni, the problems of getting out there, things were cancelled, then suddenly you don't get any refund on the flight. It's been an absolute cock-up. But So mm. two people in my family have had real problems this week. It's expensive, it's problematic. Mm. There was all the problems, obviously, with COVID and getting your passes and everything. But So that's now finished, thank God. But I think a lot of people have realised, A, Britain's a great place, to be. There's yeah. some gorgeous yeah. places. Uh, yeah. If the sun shines like it has been for quite a lot of this week, it's the most stunning place in the world. Maybe we've started to rediscover that actually, you know, staying at home and holidaying here is a good place to be. But oh, also, yeah. pile the kids in the car, take what you want. I know. I agree. I, I agree. It's but, but I love our country. But Charlie, it's bloody expensive. Mm. Compared to Turkey or Spain, it's a yep. nightmare. No, people yeah. often think if you, if you cut the travel, you save a lot of cash. No, absolutely mm. not. Try and find a try and Three star a, hotel. Precisely. Try and find thirty quid, one hundred and forty quid a night for or, a room. Or try and find an Airbnb in the southwest. They're getting clamped down on more yeah. and more. God, you're really. Or if strong. you go if you go where Neil Fox stays, I mean, seriously, <laughs> all bets are off. <laughs> I aspire to have a Neil Fox holiday. <laughs> Croyd Bay in Devon. See, that's my favourite. That's place. my favourite. Beautiful, yeah. nice. lovely. Yeah, that's why people are going abroad. It's cheaper. Mm, like absolutely. you just said, you, you get a, a five-star resort in Turkey. Yeah, and, and Britain will always than... be expensive because of supply and demand. Mm. Yeah. Because those, you know, demand for Airbnb mm. rooms yeah. and for hotel rooms is always high, particularly in the summer. Definitely. But we need a holiday this year. We do. Don't we? And As I, a country, I, Britain needs a break. We do, and mm. I really want to go away this year. I really <laughs> do. Because it's going to be the first normal summer holiday, isn't it? Without having to do COVID tests. Exactly. Mm. exactly. That's why I think a lot of people want, they're desperate to get away. So there that's probably go. why there's loads of, there's too much chaos. OK, and then your final headline, and that is in the Times. Charles, flying migrants to Rwanda is appalling. Another example, I'm afraid, of a growing theme of members of the royal family becoming very political and mm. sticking their nose where it does not belong. That's just my view. What's yours, Mark, at gbnews.uk. Uh, lots more to come, uh, including can you be friends with your neighbours? Mm. And also, why are modern women increasingly under pressure to remove all of their body hair? And I mean all of their body hair. We'll discuss that next, plus another game show. Don't miss it. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV, on radio, on digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices. With honest and civilised conversation. We're not part of the establishment. We're one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Every morning from six o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. 
Join us for Ministry of Offence, the comedy panel show that's just like the news, in that the left fights the right and it doesn't really seem to matter who wins. We cover the big stories. It was, in fact, a troop of baboons and not angry vegans. I like that. And the really important stories. Fat naked cow gets stuck in swimming pool. It's a headline in a lot of local newspapers. <laughs> yeah. We're on the same team, Nick. Yeah, but I'm just helping you. <laughs> Join us for Ministry of Offence, Saturday nights, 8 o'clock on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. The best bit of my show is when you get in touch. Love this email from Andy who sums it up. Healthy people should pay higher taxes as they scrounge off the state. Unhealthy people pay cigarettes and alcohol tax and never claim their pensions, so should pay lower taxes. Andy, <laughs> what a brilliant and, uh, you know, innovative point you've made. Uh, lots more to come from my brilliant panel, um, but uh, let us now crack on because uh, we've got lots of stories that we want to get through. And uh, let's make sure that we also keep an eye on your emails as well. But before that, this week, the legendary soap Neighbours filmed its final scene after nearly 6,000 episodes. The mood was generally rosy on Ramsey Street over the years, but they did have their fair share of disputes as well. Well, this also seems to be the case in reality in modern Britain. In fact, in northwest London, a couple are suing their neighbours through the High Court over a notoriously damaging plant which is called Japanese knotweed, which they say has infested the foundations of their £1.6 million house, and they're demanding £250,000 from their neighbours. But couldn't this have been resolved with a friendly chat? It begs the question, can we ever truly be friends with our neighbours? Neil? Of course you can. I mean, I'm friends with, with lots of our neighbours. We have a really lovely, friendly street. This is a particularly big problem, though, because that Japanese knotweed, it sounds like tr a trivial thing <clears throat> unless you've had it. And it is evil and it really grows and it goes down like three or so metres and it can get under house, it can destroy foundations. It's really dangerous and, I think and it's really hard it to get rid of. You can get 30 centimetres growth in a day. That sounds obscene. Will you forgive me? Wow. That sounds really? like a website. <laughs> it does. No, but I think, I think they, they, it grows at a remarkable... Oh, careful. Family show. Come on. <laughs> the, the, the Japanese knotweed it grows at an exponential rate. Yeah, it's, it's somehow a bit like a bamboo plant right. or related to it mm. and it does grow very quickly and it's really strong and it's really hard to get rid of, I think, once you've got it. So I, I think the story here was that the, the neighbours who have got the knotweed, they had some sort of... They got some general contractors to come in and, like, clear the garden, but that's not enough. You need specialist people to come in. They didn't do it and it's got under the neighbours, the other neighbour's house, and they're really yeah. peed off about it because it's caused some problems. Um, I, I mean, it... <laughs> I'm amazed it's become such a big news story, I have to be honest, to be yeah. fair, with everything else going on. Well, we love how this stuff, don't we? We love this stuff. Stuff. Neighbourly, Neighbourly Neighbourly guess we do. With By the way, I've just got the official fact, which is that it's 10 centimetres a day oh. that, that it grows by. Uh, the okay. Japanese knotwood. <laughs> yeah, OK, you'd still be happy with that. I'd take that. Good, good mid-show fact-check, that very important. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I mean, neighbourly disputes, are too often, and, and perhaps Neil has a point that, that, that in this particular case, you know, that, that this couple is very distressing to see mm. their home being destroyed. But so many disputes could be sorted out over a cup of tea and a chat over the garden fence. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you say that, however, growing up, I grew up in a very strange part of Surrey where there wasn't an enormous amount of community. I often had neighbours. I didn't know my own neighbours for a long time. It was such a kind of transient area. People would move in for a bit for work from overseas and then leave. Um, some of my neighbours have been uh, have been sanctioned <laughs> in recent months because they've been Russian and they've been forced out. And so you don't want to be knocking on that door accidentally having. By a the way, the drinks are on you living with Russian yeah, oligarchs. I was a, I was a very lucky young boy, I have to say. I, I was <laughs> born into great privilege, and I'm very happy about it. But I did miss out on the community streets and a, and a nice sense of uh, belonging in my area. Well, do you think the idea of relationship with your neighbours is old-fashioned? That it's generational? That young folk like yourself don't really think of having a relationship? 
relationship with no, neighbours? No, th because I don't think so. Because the best period of most young people's lives nowadays in Britain is university, when you have this kind of walking society. You can meet people next door from day one, and you're close to everyone very easily, and you don't have to get on a train or phone a friend to, to see them. You can just knock on their door. I think that's yeah, a brilliant I mean, time. Listen, you're young too, uh, Francine. Yeah. But it, I grew up, and perhaps Neil as well, watching sitcoms in the 70s and 80s, and it was all about the neighbour popping round. Yeah. And, and the neighbour was like, you know, just a best friend, really. Well, I think it's really important to have your neighbours as, as but friends. But does it still well. happen? Well, yes, it does. I mean, I've been really fortunate. I had two really great neighbours, and I was always popping. Have you got, a, you know, a bit of pasta? Have you got a bit of flour? But I have to say... I've now got a new neighbour. I hope he's not watching, cos I can't stand him. Oh, no. And, no, I really can't. He's always outside drilling and doing stuff. Is he always watching stuff. GB News later tonight? <laughs> I really hope he's not, cos he's a bit geeky. But he, he hates it my dog's outside in, oh, in the no. front, cos we've got, like, gates. Yeah. And on the other side, on my right-hand side, is a lovely elderly Greek guy, but he's always burning his rubbish. And it stinks, but mm. I like him so much. But I did, I did <laughs> this, and this is really bad, I did call the council on him, because it just got too much. I'd have my windows open and it, the stink would just come in. Has it stopped now, the burning? No, he was doing it today. Oh, and he dear. said hello to me and, he, and I wanted to say it, but you I felt bad. You couldn't see him through the smoke. <laughs> uh, well, look, uh, let's, uh, let's crack on with our final story, which leads into the game show. Emma Thompson, the actress, <laughs> says that she felt pressured to shave her pubic hair, that's right, her intimate hair, for her latest film role. This was for Good Luck to You, Leo Grande, where she filmed her first ever full frontal nude scene. She now regrets getting rid of it and suggests we're brainwashed as a society to shave our body, particularly the intimate regions. So it raises a wider question. With the widespread consumption of pornography featuring many shaved stars, are women under pressure to remove all of their body hair? Francine? Yes, they are. They definitely are, because, you know, women are perceived in a certain way now, and it's, you know to not have any hair. Like, back in the 80s, everybody had... I mean, it was known to have big hair. <laughs> but, um... You well, know, my producer you would... today, my producer Tom, is saying, whatever happened to the grounder? <laughs> but, do you know what I mean? But spider's <laughs> legs in a bikini it didn't now bite, does did it? not <laughs> look good. <laughs> so, yes, I think it's cleaner. I think it looks... I don't understand why I should have a problem with removing her hair, because it... it does See, look I go nice. the other way. I think I'd, I'd say to any lady, give it the full Brian Blessed. You know, I think it, I think <laughs> just let let nature. Would you? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that and yeah. not risk getting slapped in the face. By there the way. you go. But, but yeah. I think the point is, it's none of my bloody business what a woman does with her body. No, but can I just say, men do it now. Men mm. shave that, yeah. especially in Essex. Do you know what? I've got a designer vagina. Do you know what I mean? And in Essex, they're all bald. <laughs> Women and men. <laughs> is that right? Well, listen, perhaps what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do something uh, live on tomorrow's show. I'll, I'll get a barb around. Go for the full Brazilian. What do you think? Oh, Neil? Man, I'm glad I won't be watching. <laughs> yeah, OK. I, I will, will not be. be watching. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it is strange that no. pornography seems to have influenced... You know, what happens to women's bodies now? Well, it has... Look, let's be honest, it's not just women's bodies. I yeah. mean, look, this week, Love Island started on ITV. My, yes. my young daughter, 15, is addicted to it. I've watched oh, it to sort of get used to them. It's really good. I tell you, there's not... Apart from on their heads, there's not a hair <laughs> in that entire house that's male or female. Yeah. Right, so whatever happened to a man and his hairy chest, they've all gone. They're all smooth. Babies' bottoms all over their entire bodies. Yeah. I bet there yeah. isn't... There's a lot of veet being used well, it, or whatever it, it, it's called in that house. seconds on this, Charlie, but, I mean, it is... It's generational partly, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there is a huge amount of pressure to conform yeah. to the, mm -hmm. the cultural images you see. But, you know, men should take a stand back against this. Uh, you know, recover the hyper-masculine sense and stop shaving everything beneath your eyebrows. And <laughs> bring back the growler. <laughs> Which takes us to our <laughs> Great British Game Show. We're going to play a game of Name That Bush. That's right, let's see if my panel and you at home can name the following, following famous bushes. This is a gardening item, by the way, in case oh, you're worried. Uh, yeah. Let's have a look at this particular bush. What is that? Oh. I'm hopeless. Um, what are those flowers? Roses. 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 Bingo, it's a rose bush. Well done. Right. Okay. How about oh, this? Uh, it's fictional. Weeping Willow. J.K. Rowling. Weeping Willow. Oh, uh, it's, oh crikey, it's a this Whomping Willow. Whomping Willow. Oh. From Harry from Potter. Harry Potter. Right. Bingo. Uh, how about this next bush? George. George, <laughs> George W. w. <laughs> Next up. Uh, gosh, rhododendron. What colour is it? Oh, it's Light violet. Violet. No, you, you're on lilac. 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 It's a lilac bush. How about this one? 
Uh, it's prickly. Like you use it at Christmas. Holly. Holly Bingo. Bush. Bingo. Holly Bush. Yeah. Next up. Kate that, is not Kate. Kate. <laughs> that is not Kate. That is not Kate. That is not Kate. Kate Bush. Folks, my, my producers are so young, they don't know what Kate, Kate Bush <laughs> looks like. <laughs> That's not How Kate about Bush. our next Bush? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, the other Bush. <laughs> His brother. <laughs> Jeb Bush. Jeb, that's there it. you go. <laughs> and on that Bush note, thank you for your company. I'm back tomorrow at nine. Thanks to my brilliant panel. Stick around because I'm hosting Headliners. See you soon. Hello again. I'm Ada McGiven from the Met Office. A windy weekend in store, especially in the north. Showers, especially in the north. But some bright or sunny spells, especially in the south. A real contrast across the country from the north and northwest towards the south and southeast because low pressure, an unusually deep area of low pressure, is edging close to the northwest of Scotland. Lots of isobars on the charts showing strong winds for many, but the strongest winds will affect northern western Scotland as well as Northern Ireland. Gales around exposed coastal areas and some persistent rain moving through overnight. Now, further south, there will be one or two showers in western areas, but Actually, plenty of clear spells and it'll be a mild night for many with temperatures by and large holding up in the double figures. But in one or two shelter spots in the far south, if the wind falls light through the night, it will be a bit cooler than that. But a bright start for many, some sunshine in the south and east, but further showers will develop and those showers will affect many away from the far southeast. However, the most frequent showers and longer spells of rain will be across northwest Scotland. That's where the strongest winds will be. It will be unpleasant here with temperatures at 13 or 14 Celsius. 18 for Aberdeen. We're looking widely across England and Wales for 18 to 23 Celsius. And then into Saturday night, and the longer spells of rain move through the Northern Isles and disappear. Showers continue for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but they'll be more scattered one or two further south as well, but actually plenty of clear spells by the start of Sunday. Temperatures will be similar on Sunday morning to Saturday morning, so double figures for many, but perhaps single figures in the far south. A bright start, sunny spells for much of England and Wales, one or two showers still across northern England, but the lion's share of showers will be for Northern Ireland as well as Scotland, along with that blustery wind. It just won't be quite as windy as Saturday. Monday looks fine for many, some wet weather in the north on Tuesday. We are